professor at Edinburgh University. Uh, she's a professor of digital things. She likes to be in a band called the Dark Archives, she decided <laughs> earlier. And I think she's going to blow our minds slightly. Um, I always like listening to Melissa speaking. We closely advised the PhD when we were a little bit younger. Yeah. Uh, I was less brown haired, and I think you were probably far more sane at that point. <laughs> and she's going to tell us all about what she's up to in Edinburgh now. We've got some pretty pictures, I think. Good Thank luck. you. Cheers. Thanks, Dan. So I'm Professor of Digital Cultural Heritage, which means I'm interested in the digitisation of the past. And when I think about my practice and what I actually do, and I, if I try to explain it, I tend to split it into three different things. The first is about advanced digitisation techniques. So I'm interested in the development of technology that can aid us to move forward digitisation in new ways. I trained as an imaging scientist, started off in art history and English literature, went into computing science, my PhDs in engineering and information engineering and image processing. And so I'm interested in things like uh, multispectral imaging or 3D or 2D imaging and how we can interrogate objects. Then we have mass digitization and understanding that, that's what I used to teach in mass digitization, how you can organize these programs, how we understand them, how we can understand the user experience. But on the top of that is a third thing, what can we do with digital collections once they've been digitized at scale? What can, how can we take these large scale archives, digital archives, and use them and develop them in new and innovative ways? And these three different things interact together and I was asked to come here today to talk about a very new programme that started recently at the University of Edinburgh called Creative Informatics. And it tends to sit at the last part of that triumvirate, which is we're now engaging with collections which have been digitised over the past 20 or 30 years. We have a mass of digitised content. What can we do with it and what can we build upon it? So let me set the scene. This is activity which is based around the city of Edinburgh and its neighbours. Now, Edinburgh is famous for a lot of things. The festivals, the culture, the heritage, the collections. You might not be aware of the growing tech sector in Edinburgh, though. Edinburgh has the biggest tech sector outside of London in the UK, and it has the fastest startup culture in the UK. There's been two different unicorns have appeared out of code based startup in Edinburgh over the past five years. It's a really booming sector. So on the one hand we have the festivals and everyone comes here for the festivals and everyone wants to be engaged with culture, heritage, museums, libraries, archives. And on the other we have the tech sector and this booming activity and a vast amount of people there. But we have not built any bridges between the two. And Creative Informatics is a programme which has just recently been funded to do that over the next five years. Now, normally when I give these talks, I talk about stuff that I have done and I've worked out on, on a lot of cool stuff. It's very rare that I come and give a talk about what we are going to do. This is a talk about what we are going to do. But we've been going for about five months now, so I'm going to firstly talk to you about how it came about, what we're planning over the next five years, and then reflect on some of the issues which are already being thrown up as we walk through this process. So the industrial strategy for the UK looked at the creative industries. I will come back and define the creative industries in a little minute. But they looked at the creative industries and how important they are to the UK economy. And the current government decided to invest £80 million in the creative industries across the UK. And how they would do that is that they would choose nine different clusters around geographical cities and they would fund specific activity in each of, all of those nine different places. There's also one other cluster which is going to study us all and the effect of investing this money in the creative industries. So we were awarded £7.5 million from the AHRC to stimulate growth in the creative industries in Edinburgh with, we have an additional £2.5 million worth of match funding from the Scottish Government and from the universities. So we have £10 million now to try and make something happen with the mass of data that we've create, created in the cultural heritage sector and we're working between the University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh and Napier University, and Codebase, so that's the startup, the major startup in or the startup incubator within Edinburgh, where a lot of the tech firms are coming through, and Creative Edinburgh, which is a membership organisation which has over 3,000 members in Edinburgh and its neighbouring environments artists, illustrators, dancers, architects, sculptors. So between all this, we hope to liaise between the computational scientists who are researchers, the computer folks who are actively in the industry within Codebase, and the creative industries throughout Edinburgh. 
And the funding has come from Arts and Humanities Research Council, so there is a research element to this. What happens if you throw £10 million at an economy or, or a small ecology and see if you can stimulate growth and reuse of data? And we're being very closely watched also by the Scottish Funding Council and Edinburgh City Region Deal. So that Edinburgh itself has been given a billion pounds to support the growth of data science in Edinburgh over the next 10 years. And creative informatics is the only link between libraries, archives, museums and the creative sector and that data science growth. Most of it is predicated towards the financial services industry. But we are the voice of trying to get a much broader community involved. We've got funding for nearly five years and our project partners, we have a long, long list. I've just mentioned a few of them here. Obviously the Edinburgh festivals, there's over 30 Edinburgh festivals now, not just the festival or the fringe, there's a whole range of them. The list, so the listings of all the activities that happen in Edinburgh, the National Museums of Scotland, the National Galleries of Scotland, the National Library of Scotland, also commercial providers such as Amazon, Tesco Bank, and then smaller places like fruit market gallery and small to medium businesses are involved too. And we have appointed five research associates who are going to be looking uh, at the effect of this and trying to figure out how we can grow or monitor data science in the creative industries. The people who are, are my co-conspirators on this, it's an interesting mix. We have three academics from the University of Edinburgh, one from Design Informatics, who's leading the whole project for speed. I'm the co-director. I, um, I direct digital scholarship in the arts, humanities and social sciences at Edinburgh. But we also have someone who in pure AI from the Bayes Institute and from computing science. And from Napier, we have someone from the design side of things. And then we have Stephen from Codebase. He's just recently been given an OBE for his services to the tech industry and for startup culture. And Yasmin from Creative Edinburgh, who is that link to the, the body of people who are actively working and wanting to get upskilled in data and, and associated areas. And we have a crack delivery team who are working with us. Um, on making sure that we can reach out to businesses, we can reach out to organisations, we can reach out to different individuals and try and engage them. And then we have our five researchers, again, who have a very interesting set of backgrounds. Three of them are in UX design, so they have a lot of um, experience in looking at how tech is used and the implications of tech. Inga is a glass blower, she has her own company, um, so she's our link to the kind of physical creative industries. And a pick is um, a research assistant. She just finished her PhD in Marxist feminist art practice and poetry. We've kind of got this interesting mix of pure UX and then the kind of Marxist feminist stuff coming on too. Um, and so we're hoping that we can t kind of take a critical look at all of this and see what we're doing. This is government funding, it is industrial strategy funding, it is predicated on economic growth, but we are <coughs> academics and we have to actually figure out like what we are being asked to do and where the power structures lie and what we're actually doing. All right, so the creative industries, what are they then? What are we trying to help? The creative industries are determined by the government's creative industry strategy, right? So this is the government definition of creative industries. And it covers a whole range of stuff. Advertising, marketing, architecture, crafts, design, that's product design, graphic design and fashion, film, TV, video, radio, IT, software and computer services. So IT and games comes under creative industries. So software uh, it comes under our rubric. And then we have my area, museums, galleries and libraries. So it's just part of constellation, which also includes music and publishing. So it's our job to reach out across this broad network of people who are in Edinburgh and go, what data have you got? What can we do? What can we build on it? And how can we help you do that? And then marry it with, marry it with opportunities. We're asking four questions. How can data-driven innovation support access and engagement to new audiences and markets? How can it support the development of new modalities of experience? How can we unlock hidden value in archives and data sets? And that one is probably most pertinent today. What does it mean to take large-scale digitization and actually build new products and services on top of it? Some of which will have financial imperatives and be able to generate profit, but some of it shouldn't, and some of it should be for social good. And what does it mean to be engaging in that way? And how can we reveal new business models for the creative industries? We're doing it in six different ways. 
Most of the money is flowing outside of the University of Edinburgh, the University and, and Edinburgh Napier University. We are having a creative bridge for data-driven innovation for the creative industries. Now that is a five thousand pounds worth course, which people can take for a, a ten-week course in Codebase to learn how to be a data entrepreneur. We have challenge projects, the first round of them just closed, so those are £20,000 of seed funding to take an idea to a minimal viable product. We have resident entrepreneurs, so that's a way to connect anyone in the creative industries to work with another partner. So we are going to put 72 people within an organisation for up to six months at a time to upskill and change direction. And that comes with a £10,000 stipend to cover their losses in case they're a small or medium, small business to cover their wages. We have a creative informatics lab and studios which are happening once a month and we also have socials and we have afternoon workshops. This is incredibly important as a vehicle because it is allowing us to build up these networks throughout the whole of Edinburgh and to meet a very different slice of people. We have Horizon projects, the first call for that is just about to come out. That's going to be one call for a year. Again, we have £20,000 to work with academics who have ideas to go out into the creative industries. Oops. And then we have Connected Innovators, which is where we allow creatives to come up with their own ideas. And we have £10,000 grants, eight per year, so over the three years with 24. So there's nearly 250 minimal viable products we're trying to build. What is a minimal viable product? It's a small pilot project that might or may not work. We have to allow failure in this too. So we're throwing a whole lot of opportunity, a whole lot of training, a whole lot of resource, and we're hoping at the end of it that we have three or four or five things that really fly. That's the kind of ratio that we're looking at. And we're building up a network of folks at the same time. Just a couple of examples now. And um, I can't show you like real examples because we have a non-disclosure agreements. We've just finished the first call for challenge projects. We have 10 that have come in and we're going to fund four or five. Um, today is actually when we're doing the selection, I can't be there. Um, and I'm not allowed to talk about them until we've awarded them, then they'll become public. But I can tell you that one of the, um, Partners is of course the National Museum of Scotland and one of the things that they have is the Jean Muir archive who's a fashion designer very famous in the 1960s and we have permission to take anything in that archive and to build new stuff upon it so what does it mean if we're digitizing some of the fabric swatches then we're then reaching out to the design community and asking what can they do with that if we've managed to sort out IPR and copyright and reuse what does it mean what does it mean for digitization practices because we're not going to go in and digitize the whole archive we're talking about fabric swatches and just the book, so it's cherry picking digitization for a different practice and for a different process. How can people take that and run with it in a way that's respectful to the originator, respectful to the museum? If it does generate profit, what does that mean for the museum? How can we play about in that space and what does it mean to play? So these are the types of things we're trying to do. Another example is the data sets that we're getting from local government as well as Amazon and the banks. And what does it mean if we then throw an artist in there too as well as a data scientist to take these and play with them and reconstitute them in different ways? We don't know what this is going to look like in four years time. I hope to be able to come back in a few years time and actually show you some really cool stuff which has come from this. But we really are, we feel like we're setting up the ball, and we're hitting it and we're hoping that someone punts it back at this time. I just want to highlight a few things which are coming up as we're setting all this up. It's quite an ambitious programme. We uh, have appointed everybody. Everybody was in place at the start of April and we're now trying to roll it out. So what are some of the things which are coming back, not to bite us, but things which are we have to engage with now if we're going to get this right. The first one, of course, is data ethics. Um, we have to do all of this stuff in a way which is respectful to organisations and individuals. We have to do it in a way which will not besmirch the good name of our institutions. So, and if we're working with 200 to 250 external partners on pilot projects, the potential for something going horrifically wrong is large. So we have to get our institutional frameworks in gear to deal with that. And I can tell you now that university institutional data ethics frameworks are not put in place to deal with small businesses, right? The, the, the mechanisms don't really work. So we're having to rewrite a lot of the paperwork and rewrite a lot of the approach. And we're trying to do that in a transparent way. So that if you're interested in this, you can find out about our data ethics approaches and you can take them and reuse them and we'll put them out with a Creative Commons license and it might be helpful to someone else. 
We have to think very carefully about how we're managing data ethics across the, the programme, how we're going to approve um, and track and trace what's actually going on in these projects. Um, there's a lot of activity going to be happening over the next four or five years and data ethics. I mean, we saw the news this morning, right, about WhatsApp. This kind of thing is becoming more prevalent and we're all more, more clued up to it and we have to build this into our practices right at the start. We also have to look at what the impact of all this is going to be and make sure that we are tracking and tracing that so that we can do any good research about what the impact of this was. The second thing is how we're going to manage data. We're not just talking about researchers at one institution parking their stuff. This is across small to large businesses, different organisations. We are going to be scaling up very soon across a lot of external partners. How do we look after what we're doing? And if we're making just pilot projects, the data preservation issues with that are legion, right? It's complicated. So we have to see how we're going to do record keeping, how we're going to monitor that, how we're going to actually be able to take a snapshot of this activity over the next five years, so that five years after that we can show anybody what we actually did, given the change in platforms, the change in programming languages, the change of formats that we will expect in, in any um, project. So I kind of feel like we're being shot out of a cannon just now. Like, how are we going to deal with all this very different, complex technical things? And the answer is just to do as best as we can in a straightforward and transparent way. The third thing is about monitoring, and this is where I rant about my funders for a little minute. We have been asked by the industrial strategy to monitor everything. And this is a tweet by Pip, who um, is very rightly pointing out some of the issues. Another great event marred by excessive and intrusive photography of audience, no consent, facial recognition and biometric data, it's big business. Where is this personal data stored? What's it used for? I want to participate, not be captured. So this is the type of thing one of our staff's coming back to school. When you're doing that, what are you doing? Meanwhile, we have the government who wants us to collect all the data that we can about anyone who's participating so they can look about equality and diversity. But it meant when we were putting out the first form for people to take part in Creative Bridge, it was a 25-page form about where you were born, where you live now, how much money you earn, your sexuality, are you married, do you have children? You know, it was an invasive, invasive form to ask them to come on our course. Uh, and we went back to the HRC and went, most people are going to be put off by this process. So there, we have to make sure that the monitoring of equality and diversity doesn't have the negative effect. And this is something that we're really working out with the funders just now, because they want to draw the pretty graphs about how they're reaching out to people of colour. But actually, if you're going to be racist to them in the first place when you're asking them about that, it's maybe not the way to do it. Um, so we're, it's a, becoming a bit of an issue for us, and we're trying to work through that. The fourth thing, of course, is copyright and IPR. So if we are working with collections, we have to respect them. We have to respect the organisations, we have to respect the creators, and we have to make sure we're not just taking stuff and monetizing it. Um, orphan works is a huge issue within our sector. I published a paper about this yesterday. Follow me on Twitter, you'll see it. Um, so I'm interested in orphan works and copyright and how that links with, with uh, digitisation. But how we take any of this stuff, we know with the Gene Muir archive, we know who created that, we have the permission for reuse, but often it's not as simple as that. And if we're encouraging small design agencies to come into our large institutions and to play with our digital content, we've got to give them some advice about copyright and IPR, and we've got to hold that door open in a way that they can actually take the stuff. So when we're working with institutions on unlocking hidden value in the archives, a lot of the issues are actually copyright and IPR and helping them get over either the fear or the reality of those things. And the fifth and final issue is about the commercial imperative. So are, we've been given £10 million to develop new products and services. There is a commercial imperative. That does not sit very well with academic imperatives, which is about studying the world for the benefit of all. And so we're kind of being asked as a university to be a vehicle for industrial growth. And we have to make sure that we are a critical friend here. Um, and what happens if we do activities which are not for profit, but for social good? And there has to be room within tech at the moment for activities which are for social good, because so much of tech is, is driven just by profit, capitalist funding venues and funding avenues. We have to make sure that we keep the rest of the world open and we keep our 
institutions open to that too. Um, there has, of course, always uh, also been a lot of previous work on trying to monetize digital collections within the sector, and it hasn't worked. Don't tell our funders that, right? They've given us money to play in this in the next five years. So let's see what happens. Let's see if it's worked, and what are we going to do that's different? One of the things I'm most excited about is about the building up of the network throughout Edinburgh. We are now selling out events within two hours when they go online. We are seeing a whole mix of people come through from the libraries, archives, museums to large scale industry, to tech. Um, and these are really, anyone can come, they're free. It's a, it's a free network and it's really starting to see this bubble going forward of people bubbling up and, and it feels like an effervescent place. And one of the most exciting things for me is this is a five year program where we'll be doing this events like two or three times a month for five years. And those networks and those opportunities that we build up from that network, that will continue for another five or 10 years after the network. So it's a very important thing to take part and to, uh, and to use it to meet people. So if you'd like to get involved, we do have the monthly studios, the monthly labs, which are free for anyone who can come or who get to Edinburgh. We're not just saying you have to have an Edinburgh postcode to take part. It's, so it's actually most of the south of Scotland is welcome to come along and join in. The challenge call has just closed, but there will be another one in October. The resident entrepreneur call is currently live. So if you are either an organisation or an individual who would like to do a, a bit of switching, you know, have a look at the resident entrepreneur call. We also have the facility with our, our directorate and with our engagement team that we can help people with ideas that they have. And we have the capacity to go out and have a day where we would help listen to your problems, listen to you write your data, listen to your issues, listen to the people delivering desks for exams. And we, we, we can help put together the applications to unlock the money and help handhold through that. So if it does sound interesting, drop us an email, we'll be delighted to hear from you. So thanks very much. Um, I will hopefully be able to come back in a year or two's time and actually show you like lots of cool stuff what we have did rather than cool stuff we are going to do. But this does feel to me like a, something different in digitisation and it's a different slice and a different attempt to bring together different communities, throwing in relatively small chunks of money here and there and seeing what can happen if we give people the chance to meet each other, the time to play and the resources to back that up. Thank you very much. Thank you.